Hello, my name is Kingsley Parker, and I live in Hudson, New York, and this is one of my paintings. Uh, this is an actual tree that happens to be in Millerton, Connecticut, on a beautiful country road called Boston Corners that skirts uh, the bottom of the um, Berkshire Mountains on the New York side. And I happened to be driving on this road and seeing this tree that I thought was just an amazing shape. I got out of the car and I spent about 40, 45 minutes walking around the tree, looking at it, taking pictures with my phone. And I was just amazed at this large trunk here. This is a lower trunk and it's just massive, but it's been surgically cut off here. I guess that must have been splintered off and fell in the road and was cut clean at some point. But there are quite a few other spots where limbs have been that are not with us anymore. And then there's this part, which is just missing entirely. And this is a large tree. I would not be able to put my arms around this tree. And if I stood next to it, I'd be only about here. So this tree is on its way out, but it is still trying to hold on. It's put up these very tender, small branches here. And in the spring, when I first saw this tree, uh, there were no leaves on any of the trees at that point. Um, and I came back in the early summer, and there were just leaves on one of these um, limbs. So what I see here is just sort of a once grand tree that's been forced to uh, um, have all these setbacks, that's the name of the, the piece, uh, and yet still want to live and to push out um, living matter, leaves, etc. cetera. Uh, I paint these uh, paintings of trees, I've done other trees, and I make them large so that people can um, stand next to them and look up to them and and sort of see the grandeur that there is. By the way, all of these are on canvas rock cloths that I sew and put together. Uh, I get them from uh, commercial house painters who use them as drop cloths both inside to protect floors and furniture or outside to protect uh, bushes. And I like working um, with the texture. So all these kind of random marks and paints uh, I, I like. I think it fits the, uh, the subject matter. Um, so the sewing is a big part of this too. I, I get the proportions that I want and cut and sew the canvas to be that size. It's acrylic paint and I put a light uh, coat of uh, gesso on it and some of that is to uh, cut back some of these stains that, that are on it so that they're, that they're subtle, that they're not uh, too pronounced. Um, I've had a friend of mine call this uh, series that I do tapestries, which I like the name. I, I purposely not made frames uh, and stretched these canvases. Uh, I feel uh, that that's sort of too formal for these. I, I like being a little bit more informal, and I like the process of, of working on them, the sewing part as well. Another friend of mine said that he thought this reminded him of a medieval painting in a medieval book. I'm sorry, a, a painting in a medieval book or manuscript. And I like that as well. Um, and it's nice when you hear other people talk about your work uh, and bring up things that you didn't intend. Um, it is proof that the work, once you're not working on it and it's moved away and it's got its own presence, uh, is, is um, brings out other comments in people. And uh, this is very exciting for an artist to sort of hear about something that's sort of a little bit more than even than what they were planning on. Um, over here is a, is a sculpture. And this is made out of styrofoam. <clears throat> and I get styrofoam sheets that are two inches thick and they can be four to uh, eight feet. Uh, I stack them up, I cut them with a saw. Uh, they're very easy, they cuts like butter. And then to get rid of any sort of sharp edges like this, I use a wire brush and I sort of scrape down like this to get that 
ledge thing uh, more controlled. Um, the trouble with the wire brush is uh, the product of um, styrofoam. It's, it's very beaded, and that brush really brings that out. Uh, I can get away from the brush by uh, using a sharp kitchen knife, and that's how I did these rock areas here. And there's no bead here. This is just the styrofoam itself. So um, also this, this top, uh, once it's carved, uh, it needs some strength to it, some body. So I used a cheesecloth impregnated with plaster. And that wonderfully kind of covers the area and it sort of softens, transitions to things. Again, I would not use that here because I wanted the edge sharp and jagged here. I looked online and I found uh, some resources for uh, companies and um, shops that sell materials to uh, amateur railroad buffs. This material, for example, it has a lot of flocks in it, so it's a lot of uh, thin hair. Um, and it comes in a canister and it has holes in the top. And I can just shake that on, like I'm cooking or something, <clears throat> on adhesive. So paint on adhesive or use a spray adhesive, put the flocks on, and it begins to get this sort of soft, mellow uh, look. And there's many coats of that so that that builds up and, and gets away from this sharper stuff. And another cool thing, product they have are powders. It's a very uh, granular, small granular uh, powders that are pigmented in different colors. So that way, instead of this being monochromatic, you can sift in different colors to highlight different areas and just make it look more natural. Uh, there, there are different ways of doing trees online, I found out. I, I didn't want to buy trees, I wanted to make them. Uh, and one of the methods that I uh, came across was using barbecue skewers. And this is cocoa fiber, and it's cut to different diameters and then sort of um, distressed to, to not look so regular. And these are spray painted <clears throat> with either you know, acrylic or, or oil-based paint. And then again, using the powder to sort of get the edges of them. So what was my purpose in this? Well, I wanted to make a pristine forest landscape with no imprint of any humans on it. So that was my desire for this. So this is the back view of the sculpture. I call this sculpture harvest, and I use that word very ironically. Harvest is a wonderful word. It means a lot to a farmer. For a farmer, it means the culmination of a year's work and his livelihood. In the winter, he fertilizes his fields. In the spring, he tills and overturns the soil. And also in the spring, he seeds. And then he waits, and he waits, and he waits as the summer goes on and his, his crop matures and grows. And he's hoping for a harvest. But a successful harvest is, of course, only one of the scenarios. There's drought. There's fire, there are rainstorms and flooding, there can be uh, insect infestations. A lot can go wrong. But here is a different story. This is clear, clear cutting, and the humans here have had no, um, no interaction with the landscape, <clears throat> only to extract the resource. So there's been no cultivating here, getting the soil better, planting trees, anything like that. It's just take. First come the roads, circling up and up and up. Large trucks come in here, and there's not a lot of soil on this um, mountaintop. And the soil erodes quickly. On this end, of course, the trees and the, and the uh, canopy um, help retain the soil. But as things start to be stripped away, we lose the soil. On the other side, we had a perfect um, ecosystem. Um, but we're not seeing that here. There's nothing living here now. This is a dead zone. There are no small animals here. 
are no seeds. And it's been totally monetized. So everything of value was taken, and whatever was not of value was just kind of cast aside. And these are how these um, systems are left. For me, I was thinking of the uh, Northwest, Pacific Northwest, uh, where this is going on, this type of clear cutting, but of course it's happening in Indonesia and in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil as well. Um, I think it's, it's tragic that uh, this is so decimating to what they leave, and I'm sorry it's um, not rejuvenated like the farmer does. Um, I'm sorry that uh, th this is happening and I feel um, bad and personally responsible. I work with wood myself. I've made sculptures out of it. Uh, I've designed and hand-built a few houses that uh, my family and I have lived in and uh, fixed up and made and moved on and done another one. Um, I like wood and I, I buy building materials and I'm part of the uh, problem too. But I do think, and this is the point of this piece, that the attitude of the farmer who is nurturing this and thinking not that he'll never be back here again and he doesn't care what this looks like, but that he will be back and that he will take care of this and his family and his grandchildren. And I think we need to have that same attitude.